This video is sponsored by Lion Circuits, whose website warned me about a mistake on a super important trace on a super important board. The PPM, a millionth of something. Of what thing? Voltage, particularly 10 volt ranges on multimeters. Each millionth is 10 microvolts, and my NNNI 1906 5 and half digit DMM just doesn't have the resolution to measure voltages that low. What I need is more zeros. I mean, more digits. A 6.5 digit meter is an essential tool for anyone working with precision references and other circuits. I've hinted at it before, but only now did I finally get my extra large box of packing peanuts. Okay, it contains some genuine Nippon capacitors and another gummy USB to RS232 cable. But wait, a large grey shoe box? A prime specimen of a Keatley 2000 six and a half digit bench multimeter. Just what the doctor ordered. Thanks again to Max from the Rips Discord. This unit dates back to around 1997, so the first thing I want to do is replace the capacitors before turning it on. The rear bracket comes off after undoing two screws and the outer case slides off. Or at least is supposed to slide off. Oh, there's a sneaky little one. Even so, the folded steel sheet that makes up the outer case is hard to remove. There's a lot to see on the inside, including this rather large shield protecting the true RMS converter area. The main decoupling capacitor and regulator next to the usual 1990s digital IC spam, the analog section complete with a 6.5 digit Fox crystal, a multi slope ADC, and an LM399. Keatley spared no expense in equipping the 2000 with the most beautiful, overcomplicated fuse holder. It looks like one of the contacts is a massive spring. One end of the fuse is clamped into the holder. Just like the TTI, the Keatley allows selection of the mains input but implemented in an even more over-the-top way using this piece. Rotate till the desired mains input voltage is seen through the window and insert. Putting this together feels like arming a nuclear weapon. Moving on, to free the main board, these nuts <sighs> have to be removed from the back panel. Luckily for me, this time the front and back panel input jacks have the wires attached to them using tight connectors of some kind except the current input, which is somehow tethered to the front panel jack. Those two little tabs were a dead giveaway. In the end, I had to desolder the wire to free the main board. The chassis has a few interesting details like the option slot, which opens up a lot of possibilities, and the long push rod to the power switch. A similar setup is used for the front rear input selection switch. I don't need the stand, of course, and to remove that, turn it till the arrows line up and pull. Same thing on the other side. Undoing the newly exposed screws frees the front panel assembly. And then there's the crusty mains transformer that makes up the bulk of the instrument. The front panel and input jacks couldn't be separated. Don't ask me what these blemishes are, all I can say is that acetone and old plastic don't mix. Disturbing. The VFT makes a triumphant comeback. They seem to be the only accepted display for high-end test equipment. Unlike the higher-end models, the 2000 main board is the only PCB inside and houses both the analog and digital sections, suitably isolated. The surface of the PCB is an immaculate matte finish and I would like to keep it that way. No idea what cheap solder and flux might do, but leaky electrolytics can do worse, so I'll go ahead with the recapping. Fortunately, the 2000 has a grand total of only 5 electrolytics. To make soldering easier, I'll suck excess solder out of the pads. The board has neat silk screen and parts lists and schematics are available on the XDEVs website, making this job easier. I didn't have a replacement for that one large capacitor. It seems healthy, so I'll just put it back in. A Q-tip soaked in isopropyl alcohol seems to do the job pretty well. Sometimes I wonder why I put so much effort into making my PCB designs look so neat. The front panel is held in place by these two plastic pips. One of them came loose during shipping and scared the living daylights out of me. 
Did I break it already? Oh, it's not plugged in. Of course, I had forgotten to plug in the front panel connector. That's more like it. Six and a half fast digits of goodness. Who in their right mind would use this meter in three and a half digit mode? And it is fast. Much faster than I would expect from an integrating ADC, of which this meter is a perfect example. The classic LM399 reference, an integrated resistor network, a composite integrator made of one precision and one fast op amp, an NE5532 slope amplifier, and an LM311 comparator. It's the template for nearly every DIY multi-slope ever. It is controlled by this blob and the exquisite Fox crystal. Now for some waveforms. The Keatley 2000 ADC scheme has one large zeroing cycle followed by measurement cycles interspersed by smaller zeroing cycles. The multi-slope topology is, of course, PWM. The slope amplifier is of the regular unity gain with diode clamp zero crossings type. Those artifacts at the end of a multi-sloping cycle is the integrator capacitor discharging through the discrete MOSFET zeroing switches. Talking to this meter in SCPI from the operation manual through the Arduino serial monitor was a breeze. MSXL likes the exponent-based output format too, which is a massive luxury. Little did I know, I was in for the worst case of cross-platform protocol nightmares ever. It's time to put the long cables to work and try talking to the meter remotely using the shiny new Raspberry Pi 4B. That wasn't very nice. The Python script works perfectly on Windows, but it's a completely different story on my Raspberry Pi running Raspbian. My Scopes RS232 decoder does not like what is going on between each byte of the serial data stream. Focusing on a couple of bytes, there is a bit's worth of gap between each byte, which seems to throw my scope off. Now, as much as I would like to joke about throwing a Pi Pico at everything, Dimin suggested using this USB to UART bridge project based on the Pi Pico. I had the right connector and was able to hack it together. The waveform seemed promising, but the Keatley ended up being a party weeper. Don't even ask me what I was trying to do here. Having ignored everyone else, I took some advice from Max and decided to try inverting the RX and TX lines to and from the meter using a 4010 inverter, carefully selected from my logic collection. Dimin sent me some code to initialize the meter to the 10V range with a 10PLC integration time and read once every second. The voltage readings are complemented with temperature from a second Pi Pico reading an LM35 which has become my favourite IC when I learned that it was designed by the same person responsible for the LTC-1000. The program outputs a convenient CSV file complete with date and timestamp for ultimate logging. But the question remains, what am I going to measure with this low-budget setup? What do I put on the other end of these metrology-grade Q-tips? This PCB was manufactured by Lion Circuits and it's come out beautifully, down to the thin traces and the thermal ring. A link to their website is in the description below. The PCB, along with a few other parts, is going to turn into an LM399 reference with a scaling amplifier to turn the Zeno voltage to approximately 10 volts. This PCB was originally meant for the LTC1000, but I realized it could be hacked to accept an LM399 as well. Not without some bodges. In this case, the copper wire resistance is much lower than the trace resistance, so it doesn't matter. The reference works and puts out a voltage of a little more than 10 volts. As long as it is stable, I CBA to trim it to exactly 10 volts. I made this thermal isolation chamber a while back to run temperature sweeps with my printer bed as the heater. And now it will serve as a shield against ambient temperature swings. Hopefully. There is one missing ingredient in this thermal isolation recipe. This SLA printed cap was made by Sassy from the IMKC Discord. According to this much quoted app note, a cap around the reference can reduce random fluctuations caused by air currents. Speaking of temperatures, what's this? My LM35 reading a good 5 degrees above ambient? It all comes down to common sense. The Keatley and its passively cooled voltage regulators heat the outer shell. The heat then travels through the exposed contacts on the breadboard to the leads, ultimately heating up the die. Classic beginner mistake. 
Anyway, with everything covered and connected, I'll leave this thing alone for 24 hours. It's a miracle that these strands never met and caused the reference to short out. I'm left with a CSV file full of juicy data. First off, I'll set the number of decimal places on this voltage column to 5, so I can see exactly what is going on. Then I'll copy the first voltage and subtract it from itself. This first voltage is now our 0 ppm reference. This column records the voltage difference of each successive reading from the initial reading, and by dividing this difference by a millionth of the initial voltage, we finally get the ppm values. With a little plotting, manipulation and labeling, the data is ready and presentable. Despite the amount of thermal isolation, there was still some drift with temperature which comes out to around minus 3.3 ppm per degree C. I have no idea why the readings have 10 ppm peak to peak of noise. And that was our first set of data. What next? Given my limited time in India, I think it's high time I take on the world's second best, the LTZ1000, now that I have a decent setup. I would like to thank Lion Circuits for sponsoring this video with their PCBs. They are an India-based PCB manufacturer who offer assembly and component sourcing. Check out their services, link in the description.